In today's episode, Chloe and I talk with our friend Jenna Zafino, who is a Pilates superstar legend. The conversation is wide ranging and covers Jenna's history learning from Ron Fletcher, why we need to do away with the guru model in Pilates, finding your voice as an instructor, transitioning to online teaching, and a lot more in between. I know you're going to get a lot out of our conversation with Jenna Zafino. Hey, Chloe. Hey, Raf. Hey, Jenna. Hey, Raf. This is this is exciting. <laughs> so we've uh, we've got an uh, incredible guest on the show today, uh, the one and only Jenna Zafino. Yeah. Although I have learned how to clone myself recently, so I will tell you all oh, about that. So okay. there, I am the one and only, but now I can be in multiple places at once. So I'm oh, this excited is, about that. Oh, this this is this is impressive, and I'm excited about this. So we usually just start off with a little how are you going. And uh, so I think we should do that again today. Yeah. And then I'd love Jenna to, I mean, if our listeners don't know who Jenna Savino is, I would be shocked, but I would love, love you to tell us a little bit who you are and et cetera. So, yeah. Well, I'm going to kick off with saying that I'm having the best morning ever because <laughs> – I'm getting to, I woke up and it was like Christmas morning, getting to speak with both of you and Jenna. Uh, Jenna and I have been friends for, oh, it's a long time now. What, mm -hmm. Like, I, oh, I, I feel like Facebook maybe told us the other day. Yeah, but it was it's, something like 2016, 2017, around there, maybe yeah. 18. L One of those. Earlier, earlier. Long, yeah. long, long time. And uh, I'm we trying to think of the New York <clears throat> sitting in my sister's apartment at five in the morning interviewing you. Yes. <laughs> like, I must like her if I'm up this morning. This early. <laughs> <laughs> so we were lucky enough, both myself uh, and Raf's also been on an episode of well, as well of your podcast, Pilates Unfiltered. And I think, was it Alice, uh, Kat and I that were the first Aussies? On the podcast, right. is that right? That's right. Yeah. How fantastic! Yeah. First Aussies on the moon, <laughs> and here and here we are. It's kind of this uh, incredible moment to now. Raf and I have a podcast and get to have you on it, which for me is just like, poof! I'm the head exploding emoji. Mm. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm excited about it because as you people who listen to Pilates Unfiltered might have noticed that I took a a bit of a 2020 hiatus and I've just been dripping in here and there, trying to wrap my head around where we go forward. But the fact that you all have come to the table with a unique vision and model for your show, and there are a few others who I feel have really had the, the just the consciousness to think about what does this want to be other than just you know, picking up a microphone and talking about what's wrong with Pilates. Um, I enjoy that. I cheer you on. I'm happy about it because the whole intention of Pilates Unfiltered was to start a conversation. And I knew that I wouldn't always know where that conversation went to. And I know a lot of people listen to me and probably to you too and yell at me in their car and talk back or clap or, or agree. <laughs> yeah. But the fact that they can do it with more people <laughs> and, and more shows and more voices and more uh, perspectives, that's that's amazing to me. So yeah, it's fantastic on the podcast. And I noticed yeah. how you really sort of snuck back in under the radar with that, with that new episode of Pilates because I was like, is it over? When is it coming? Yeah, and it was like, yeah. ooh, and I love that you did that. I love that you just snuck it in and it was like, mm, there might be a new episode of Pilates Unfiltered up. It was very cool. Yeah, it was, you know, I think um, like many things within a creative process, sometimes you get the hit and the pieces fall into place and the space and the time and the clarity of mind is there. And I just... I made a distinct decision to not edit and not produce the first few episodes that I come back and also to give myself permission to just back off of them if they weren't feeling like it was coming from a really true and grounded place because that's the voice that I felt, honestly, I was losing in the infrastructure of what Pilates Unfiltered had become, which was wonderful. Don't get me wrong. I mean, the guests, the conversations, everything. I'm so proud of what 
I was able to create it and create and the support that I got from so many people. But I, I felt like my voice was getting a little lost in the machine and that I needed to step back away from agreeing with many guests and being a host of a party to really figure out like, what is this, what do I want to do with this platform? And, Mm. and the project might be complete. Like I'm still not quite sure, Mm. but in the meantime, I know I enjoy getting on the microphone. I know I have things to say. I know that my lifestyle, especially being primary, you know, primary parent with my son for the most part, um, it's, it's challenging to find the headspace to sit down and record and be articulate Mm. and get it all out. Um, So I am just having a lot of grace with myself. And I I know that I'm not worried about timing. I used to be, but I'm not worried about it anymore. The last year plus has shown us anything. It's like, yeah, get after your dreams, but don't do it in a level of scarcity or urgency. Don't, don't rush after it because you find yourself in burnout in a heartbeat and I'm, mm. I just won't go there again. So I did, I was feeling a little of it with Pilates unfiltered and um, I'm, I'm very content with what I've done with it. And I'll be happy when, I, whenever, whenever I jump on that mic, I know it's the right place to be. Mm. And, you know, as um, our friend James Crater had said, he's like, you know, it's really you in the city of Chicago. That's your co-host, you know, cause yeah. I'm telling stories about the city or the train is in it or, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm letting myself sip my coffee instead of editing out every, you know, yeah. lip smack or voice crack or whatever to make sure that it's worthy of the Pilates world. Yeah. And that is really, that's really where I was stuck in. I know we're going to talk about it a lot, but I yeah. was, I, I needed to break that for myself, for my, for my mental well being and my, my livelihood going forward. I needed to mm. cut it. Ah, I'm, I'm so, <laughs> this is going to be the most amazing <laughs> episode. Mm. Um, there's just there was so much just in in what you said there. And just just side note, I'm loving all your Insta stories. You know, taking us through Chicago. Oh, I thought you were going to say plants. No, well, and your plants, <laughs> and your plants. Actually, to be honest, when I see you caring for your plants as much as you do, I get this little pang of guilt in my stomach that I'm a bad plant mama. <laughs> And I think, oh gosh, yes. And actually it's usually a good reminder for me, Jenna, to water my plants. When I see you yes. doing a little post on caring for yours, it's a good Aww. little, it, it sends me off to water my plants. But I, I love that with your Instagram, I feel like I'm getting to know, like I'm getting to know Chicago. Like I just love that you take us on your walks with you and you, you know, it's, it's actually a real gift, uh, like, I feel like I'm getting to explore authentically Chicago without being there. And obviously one day I want to be there and come see yeah. you and go see John. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's really lovely. So I, I can really feel that. Mm. Oh, I'm glad. I mean, I think it's through the lens of things that people, everybody thinks of the downtown and the Gold Coast, but they don't often, they don't know that Chicago's this vast city of multiple neighborhoods different than New York. It's much larger and more spread out, but there's these little kind of um, ecosystems mm. and and um, it's very cute and very interesting. It is quite segregated, I will say, from neighborhood to neighborhood, right. um, whether we're talking about like diversity in general or just like the sorts of people who flock to these little pieces on the grid. But when you have... Uh, an open mind and a bit of a wanderlust. There are so many beautiful unknown places in the city that are just like, they're just heart filling. And you just, you, you want to tell people about them because they just think of the magnificent mile. And it's so much more than that. So oh much my, more than that. I can't wait yeah. to go. I can't wait to come and visit one day when the world opens back up. I know. Yeah. I know. How are you, Raph? Oh, are you good? Yeah. Fuck, oh awesome. yeah. Hey Raph. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, Jenna. I just, I just remembered, there's Raph. <laughs> yeah, I'm awesome. Um, I, I actually want to, um, I mean, I'm so happy to be here talking with, with both of you. This is, you know, this is fun. It's, I can't believe, it's, can't believe we get paid to do this. Well, that was my thought as well. When I woke up, I went, what? This is our job. This well, is great. We, actually, we don't really get paid to do this. We get paid to certify people to become Pilates instructors and then we <laughs> take the luxury of <laughs> doing this on work time. <laughs> 
Right. So right. Let's, 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 let's be honest. Well, that's only because we haven't talked about procuring sponsors yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Jenna, I just like, I, I want, it struck me actually what you said because I, I was surprised to hear you say that about you f- um, feeling like your voice got lost and in, in the machine of Pilates Unfiltered mm-hmm. and that you, you were tired of filtering. You know, yeah, <laughs> it felt like the ultimate paradox. I mean, I've had I've had conversations with my close friends that are like, "So when are you actually going to get unfiltered?" And I was <laughs> like, "I know, I know." It did feel. I mean, what I can say about it is, when you are hosting a party, you want everyone to feel comfortable, and as mm-hmm. a host, I think that's something <sighs> that I have an innate ability to do and mm-hmm. I enjoy doing that yep. um, and there were a couple of instances and I'm not going to name names and uh, honestly um, probably the the top of this category were not aired um, where I know my values I know what I stand for in this world and I, I also I can I also understand sarcasm and humor and what was coming across, in some of the conversations could have been put under the umbrella of sarcasm, humor, the good old boys, the joke kind of thing. But it was really, it was, it was putting me up against a wall that said, Mm. this is there, there tends to be two worlds. There's the world of Pilates and then there's the, the rest of the world. And how can I be one way in the rest of the world, but let this slide because it's acceptable in in Pilates? And some of the comments were misogynistic. Some of them were, um, I would say, very racism light, but nonetheless, you know, they're not blatant, maybe a little undercover. Um, Some of them were classes. Some of them were very um, looking down the nose. Some of them were eye rolling at other, other teachers, other methods, other styles of movement. And I'm just done with it. I'm just done. It's like, we can go to the, be the change you want to see in the world and make it very um, inspirational. Or we can go to the, what the, wait, are we swearing on this podcast? Fuck you. Oh. <laughs> okay. So we can go to the Jenna, what the fuck are you waiting for? Stop pretending like this is okay and shut it down for a bit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that when you explore what you stand for and you create a platform that gives you a microphone in front of it and you find yourself cutting pieces of conversation that you know would be hurtful for others to hear Mm. or throwing away episodes that have robbed an hour of your time because you know Mm. it's just not what you want your listeners to hear and feeling compromised every which way from Sunday. And then also understanding that in many ways, the industry that you're supporting has really tried to harm you through blatant, um, what is the world, uh, what is the word, uh, just gossip and, and, um, I'm losing my thought, but just, there have been individuals that have tried to just stand in my way and paint me as somebody who was power, fame, money hungry. And that, that isn't who I am Mm -hmm. in the least bit. And for anybody who's taken a minute to get to know who I am, they understand that my, my whole entire business is steeped in teaching and moving from the heart. Yep. It's steeped in creating impact and helping people who are normally not heard come up. Um, I was speaking to uh, somebody the other day and I, one of the most joyful aspects of my entire career is the fact that I am in the behind the scenes of so many wildly successful individuals either in their journey to get there or currently helping move them forward and nobody knows. And I only say that because it's when I sit and I was being just rapidly engaged with, uh, with things that were untrue about how I was creating my own method or stealing teachers or, you know, out for fame or blah, all this stuff. And I'm like, you don't, you don't know what's happening. And this is, this is the, 
the condition of this, of the Pilates culture as it was, one person says something, it spreads like wildfire. We all freak out and we're scared that if we stand up or say mm. anything against mm. that, we're going to lose whatever we think we have. Mm. And then, and then what, you know, and then what, and I don't want to live in that world anymore. I, I haven't for quite some time. Mm. My heart is bigger. My head is wider. My life is more rich. And I want to really continue to engage in experiences that this is my, this is our affirmation for the month and my membership experiences that add value to my work and energy to my life. Mm -hmm. And so I needed, I, I'm never afraid to burn it down to build it back up stronger. And so that's what I feel like I've been been up for fuck yeah we oh need my a gosh that was yeah. just i was just enthralled with that entire uh wow everything you just said there jenna that's incredible yeah. can i just say um like what you just said at the end there about you know people uh you know gossiping about you or accusing you of um what did you say you know stealing instructors creating your own method being out for fame it's like well yeah you know, all right, stealing instructors. Well, in the corporate world, that's considered perfectly, absolutely normal and acceptable. It's like if, if you get <laughs> Again. A, a better offer, you know, if your mate just called headhunting. It's called headhunting. Yeah. Right? It's just a normal part. <laughs> it's like, well, if 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 I'm employed by Studio A and they're not paying me much or treating me well, and then Studio B says, Hey, look, we'll pay you more and treat you better, and I've got a more compelling vision and you can make a big difference in the world, come work for us. I'm like, Well, how is that a bad thing? You know? Um it's because we're also emotionally invested in this work. And, and I, you know, as somebody whose business is steeped in the heart, I also, as you know, have a distinct mind for business. I've been working mm -hmm. in this industry for over 20 years and some of the major corporate players in the health club system in Chicago and onward. I've done consulting. I'm working in consultantship right now. And the reality is, is that when we pretend like this thing that we do, outside of the miracles of movement and the facilitation of independence and the fearless movement outside of all of that, when we pretend that it's not a business, then we're running a sort of, you know, or community gathering and um, the boundaries, the lines are extremely blurry. And then we get emotions involved and then we get these long seated, you know, sorts of uh, fighting and feuding and no more. No more. It's, it's, it's business. And I think, you know, there's integrity to business too. I don't particularly want to be part of an industry that's cutthroat and, and, mm. you know, you know, just the highest bidder sort of thing. But I do want to be a part of an industry that takes its business seriously and understands that, um, that every move that a person makes has less to do with their relationship with you and more to do with the need and want of their actual life like paying right. rent and you know growing as a as a human and all of those things so yeah yeah and um those other two things you mentioned making up your own method it's like well so i mean i'm not saying you did make it up your own method but it's like so what if you did you know like <laughs> i just i spoke about this the other day and i was like at what point do we like get to the place in our career as a movement teacher where you no longer have to cite your source. And this is for some people out there, it's going to be a controversial statement, but realistically speaking, I know where I came from. If there's something that I'm teaching that is inherently Ron's, I'm going to say it. I'm going to make a reference to it in the context of a class. Mostly these kind of like finger pointing things happen on Instagram where you literally have one minute and more. Now it's like 30 seconds to get somebody to pay attention to maybe give you a chance to work with that. Right. So we're, we're in this space where we're adults. We've had decades of experience. We have something to say about it. And when do we get to say that, mm. you know, what is, what is the thing? And I think like, again, in the real world, we just need to say it. We just need to stand in the truth of what we believe. And we need to admit that, hey, there were some things that I learned that didn't work for my body or I didn't agree with or, you know, didn't align with my value system. Um, or there were some things that are really great and I had nothing to do with creating them. And here's where it came from. But the reality is our clients don't care. They really could care less. You're, you're, you're literally yeah, that's such a good point. checking <laughs> your own self. You're like waiting for Joseph Pilates to walk in the room if you're citing every single situation that you're teaching. 
And secondarily, it it actually can discount a bit of your credibility. Mm. And I think that teachers who teach from the language of their own experience and use the citations as support for that language are so much more effective. If you're sitting there and you can say, I remember the first time I learned stomach massage and like all of you in this room, I was very aware it is not a massage. Uh, yep. Let's talk about the origins of this movement, <laughs> however. Let's talk about maybe where it came from and how we're going to look at it. Now, here's some things that work well for me. I'd like you to try them and see if they work well for you. Maybe somebody will come up with a better strategy. Wouldn't that be amazing mm. in the room? You know, so that mm. that kind of, um, if we want to continue legacy, we have to create room for more voices to be involved in that legacy. And there's always the argument about like, well, what about the people who go, I'm going to just like the cliche, what about the people who go to the weekend certification and then they say they're a master teacher? My clients are not going to them, Yeah. by the way. They're never going to go. I had a person, I, I'm going to see her tomorrow. She said, I know you're not seeing any clients. I've been to acupuncturists, chiropractors. I've been to all of these different doctors. Would you please consider seeing me for a session? Because I always feel better when I see you. Now, I don't consider myself any kind of guru whatsoever. I just look and listen and watch and guide and receive in input from her. And we work together. And there's a magic concoction that you all know, that biopsychosocial situation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that happens in those sessions that's landing on that body better than any of the other providers. That person is never going to go just for the Pilates on the business card or the door. They're seeking out somebody who has something to say, who is convicted about their beliefs, who pays attention to their clients and may or may not know history or be able to cite it, but knows exactly what they need in that moment. Mm. And I would say, um, I mean, I 100% agree with everything you just said, but I would say that like those people that, you know, that belly ache about all oh, the weekend certifications and I see it just about every day on the forum somewhere all oh, these you know weekend courses or whatever it's like well if those courses are so terrible right well if the client can't tell the difference between someone educated on a two-day you know training and someone who's done an 18-month apprenticeship well what the fuck value is the 18-month apprenticeship if the client can't tell the difference right exactly <laughs> so like, well, if you if, exactly well, why are we worried about this <laughs> And also let's talk about the equity of sometimes there are, there is a situation where a person has, maybe they've spent a lot of money on a personal training certification and their client wants to do some Pilates and they want to teach that client and they don't want to go through a comprehensive training and they take a weekend certification and maybe they have all of this anatomical and biomechanical knowledge from personal training that by the way, because it's body movement, they can apply directly to the 16 exercise they learn in a weekend certification. And voila, you have some value there because the client has asked them for it. So there, are, it's too easy to poo poo other things. I mean, this is, this goes back to when I was in the health club. Um, I was one of a few women who were working. I was breathing audibly and often, you know, laying down and moving my leg in ranges that other people were not. And people were intrigued and they were also a little bit weirded out because it wasn't like, you know, a, a, a deadlift or something. Um, and they would, as a result of their discomfort, poke a little fun. And they would sometimes offer me a little advice on how to do it differently, not knowing anything about what I was trying to do, you know, as, as, as some genders can to other genders, especially in the health club environment. Um, and I remember speaking with one, one trainer and saying, you know, what's really interesting is that 90% of the time when someone offers me advice on how I'm doing something, they never inquire as to the conversation that was happening before, during, or after that thing in the moment with my client. They never inquire as to the condition that my client walked in with mentally. Were they stressed out? Were mm -hmm. they, you know, were they, they're, 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 they're giving me advice unsolicited that points to an ideal that may or may not have anything to do with the situation at hand and the interaction between me and the other human being in front of them. So it's irrelevant. So I don't care who you're critiquing. We know, we know that there are, you can go on TikTok 
or YouTube and see 9 million examples of a dumb approach to fitness, right? <laughs> Just a thing with a reformer or a kettlebell that, you know, is caught on a camera that's like, you know what, you could have thought that one through a little more. But I like to believe that people who get into the world of fitness and wellness in general are doing it to help other people. There's always an exception to the rule. But I don't think anybody says, you know what, I'm going to get in that studio and fuck up some bodies today. <laughs> I don't think they do it. No. Yeah. We, we've, we've spoken about that before, haven't we, Raph? We, as you said, Jenna, there's always exceptions, but for the most part, everyone's in this because they're wanting to help people feel better, et cetera, yep. et cetera. And they coming from a place of goodwill and doing the best they can yeah. with what they know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm just thinking um, when you said that about unsolicited advice from males in the gym, I just think like, yeah, worst pickup line ever, you know, go and tell someone what they're uh, doing. Right, it's know? so <laughs> painful. I mean. But they, and, yeah, it's so, yeah. Uh, that's why I'm loving the, the gym I'm going to at the moment because there's like no one there. <laughs> so, and, yeah. and, and then when they are, they're, it seems to be mainly females. It's fantastic. Mm. And we just all mind our own business and do mm. our workout. Wouldn't it be great? You know what's changed though is the so the bro culture that used to be in the gym is now in LinkedIn. Huh. That's the oh. interesting part. Let me invite you to this training. I'd love to help you out. Let me show you what to do with your business. Let me do this. Yeah, <laughs> you right. got no clue. You have no no point of reference. There's a book called The Big Enough Company. Um, I'm not going to remember the authors. They're two women, but the, the book is called The Big Enough Company, and it's how scaling your business to a reasonable size to you know make, make the income that you want to make but not overwhelm yourself with, with burnout. And one of the quotes in there is that advice is generally never missing good intent, but always void of context. And I remember that all the time. Mm. So they haven't, people who offer that unsolicited, unless they've asked you, not if you want the advice, unless they've taken the time to inquire as to what is actually going mm -hmm, on mm -hmm. in the condition. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, what's even, even in the gym, what's your goal? Or even on LinkedIn, what is your business about? Who mm -hmm. do you serve? Mm -hmm. Who do you speak to? I mean, you know, it's pretty, I, I've learned to be discerning in my years of being a small business owner. And it's, it's entertaining if you let it be, see, seeing what mm. people think of as, you know, client pickup lines now. <laughs> um, I, I'm the, I'm the, so I'm the recipient of a lot of those pickup lines. If you put it, if you're classing pickup lines, not as like sexual, but like, Hey, let me pick you up as a client sort of thing. Oh yeah. Um, on, on, on social media, I get a lot of, Oh yeah. Uh, because get you the followers you want. Yeah. Cause I'm an, <laughs> I'm an exercise physiologist and I'm a Pilates instructor. So I get a lot of people, they must, you know, see that on my profile or whatever. And like, Hey, do you want to get you know, five new clients in the next 90 days or yeah, whatever? Right. Um, and I'm like, yeah, no. But. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm okay. Thank you. Yeah. Hard pass. Um, Jenna, I'd love you. I, I know you mentioned um, Ron uh, earlier. So I, yeah. I know who you're referencing and, and Raf knows who you're referencing. And I'm sure there's a lot of lot of our listeners that would, but there might also be a lot of our listeners who don't. We also have yeah. um, listeners who are exercise physiologists. We've got um, physios listening. So we've got a lot of uh, people who actually listen to the podcast as well that aren't as steeped in knowing kind of names of elders, et cetera. So could you give sure. us a little, could you flesh out who who is Ron and, you know, where Ron came in your journey uh, and that might segue us into, yeah, talking about that sort of yeah. the, the impact and then segueing into guruism, et cetera. Does that sound... Sure, sure. Sound, sound yep, I will juicy do my enough. Best. <laughs> Sorry, that juicy was a, enough, that was a yeah. lot. <laughs> it's a lot. So let it's me see if I can do the crib note version. So yeah. um, for the genealogy, you have Joseph Pilates, and of course you have Clara, and then you have a number of, of teachers who came into this the studio in New York City as students and who later were gifted the opportunity to teach the work. Ron Fletcher was one of uh, what who, it's it's a it's another point of controversy who's recognized as a first generation teacher mm. and who isn't depending yeah. on their age and when they came into the studio but let's just say he's one of a handful of first generation teachers 
Um, he was a performer in New York City. He injured his knee sliding on doing a knee slide into the orchestra pit at Radio City Music Hall. He heard about uh, Joseph Pilates from some of the dancers in New York. He went to Joe. He went up into the torture chamber. Joseph said, lay down on this mat, one bone at a time. He laid down. Joseph said, are you straight? And Ron was perplexed because, of course, he was a gay man. And he said, <laughs> Ron said, I think so. And Joe said, well, you're not. And that was the first session. And he, kept, he continued to go back. He continued to go back. And then his career led him. He was a producer, a dancer, a choreographer. And his career led him to L.A., and what can and, I, what sort of year what year are we talking around about here? Like when would he have first uh, met Joe, approximately? So I always forget these dates, but I know that um, it's it's around the I believe around the fifties and sixties because yeah the fifties and sixties because yeah, then he went away for the studio from some for some time and after yep. Joe died he came back in and studied extensively with Clara as right. part of his kind of rehabilitation program from alcoholism. So he had, he had decided that he was no longer going to drink and he had been, he actually had a really, um, a really troubling time with alcoholism where he was fired from a number of jobs. Um, he was choreograph choreographing uh, for the ice capades and he was let go from that position for not showing up to a rehearsal. There is a beautiful documentary um, on the Fletcher Pilates website that goes into the history and the dive diving into the, um, the full story, but he came back to study with Clara for a number of years. And there are letters also on the Fletcher Pilates site that reference their relationship and, at some point, Ron decided that he wanted to go to California and he asked Clara explicitly if he could teach the work in California, because at the time, um, you know, it was just, it was, we were, we're getting into the time where the trademark mm. was happening, um, but it hadn't quite happened yet. And so Ron spoke with Clara specifically about going to teach that work in California and she gave him her expressed mission and mm -hmm. said, we've only reached the tip of the iceberg with this work. There's much to do and you are the person to do it. And so you can read those words on the Fletcher Pilates website. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's an interesting piece of the Pilates history. The other interesting piece is that Ron opened his studio in Beverly Hills and really truly started the Hollywood boom of Pilates. So you had mm. old stars like Ali McGraw, Ben Vereen, um, Sandy Duncan, Nancy Reagan, uh, Betsy Raquel Bloomingdale. Welch. There were all the ladies. Yeah, all the ladies who lunch came right. in. Um, Candace Bergen, lots of lots of um, high. It would be like the Kardashian hotbed right. of that time, in the yep. 70s, 80s. Um, and he also um, he also started touring to different kind of clubs and spas and to St. Francis Hospital, where he initiated the first Pilates based program for some of the, the patients there. Mm -hmm. um, and the name that you would want to associate with that is Patrice Whiteside. She's the person who kind of took that program over. Um, and he he had assistants, um, Diane Severino, you want to know about. She was his right-hand woman and somebody who, if you do get a chance to study with, is amazing. Um, so in any case, he, uh, he traveled and then at some point get, uh, gifted the studio over. Diane, I think, says they paid a dollar for it the Beverly Hills studio and they kept it running for some time wow. and he um, kind of went on with his life. And um, there were a number of students who decided that his work shouldn't be undocumented and should be preserved. And so they pulled together the Ron Fletcher program of study as it was known um, around, I think the early 2000s, late nineties, early 2000s. And um I may be a little off on the dates, but I came into the program around 2002 to four. Initially, I had already taken a full comprehensive program. I was teaching, I was working in the health club. Um, and I had walked into a studio where I saw a quote on the wall from Martha Graham, which is part of my dance pedigree, and a quote on the wall from Joseph Pilates and a quote on the wall from Ron Fletcher. And I was like, 
uh, this is this is home. I need this work. Mm. And so at the time, there was a lot of travel involved. And what we would do is either travel for 10 days at a time, stay in Tucson, study and work our asses off, just learning and getting the movement in our body. That was the main tenet of the program. Get the movement in your body. And then when you know it, teach what you know and teach it impeccably. That's one of his his quotes. Um, so I, I did uh, the remote program and then we would fly wherever Ron was doing a three-day weekend and you would just kind of um, go without expectations, sit at the foot of a master, literally most times listen to stories of Joe and Clara, which was really special for anybody who was fully invested into the Pilates method and, and learn, learn patterns. He was always working on choreography. He was always working on different patterns. And um, at some point I was asked to become a disseminator of his work. Uh, one of, I believe, only nine original students that were asked to take the work out in the world. And I taught the the program in my studio for a decade. And Ron was fond of me, I think, because of my dance background and also because of my dog. Um, he would leave long voice messages for the dog on my for machine. Horatio. And um, yes, for Horatio, Aww. he... He said that he wanted to pick him up and he would say, he would leave him a message that said, the limo will be waiting for you at the airport. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's fantastic. You know, it's, I wish, you know, I didn't save the messages. It's like that, I don't, it was digital phone, you know, so, you yeah. know, it's not like it was on tape and I wish I had those, but I have lots of emails to the dog. <laughs> wow, <laughs> I love not, this. And, um, and, you know, I, I feel like we have, we had a friendship in that, um, we would call and we would chat. He would want to, he would ask my opinion on things, not in a powerful way, not in a way of like influence. I was not, nobody was an influencer to Ron Fletcher. <laughs> like, let's just be <laughs> clear on that. But, um, you know, I had many sessions where I would have the phone in one ear um, and I would be up against the pedipole and he would be asking me, how does this feel? And I would talk to him about how it felt in my spine, or he would say, you know, the piece we worked on in this city, wherever it was, I wonder what happens if you do X, Y, Z, getting a little choked up talking about it. Um, mm -hmm. And it was, it was a wonderful, magical relationship. Mm -hmm. And he was 1000% a human being. And he was an older human being with aches and pains and he could lose his temper or show up late or become frustrated or forget or be tired. And, you know, all of that was very evident to me as an adult working with another adult. I think if I had been younger when mm. I started working with him, I may not have noticed as much. You know, I can remember mm. my dance teachers having the fits, leaving, throwing their hands out, walking out of the room, kicking people out, you know, losing their minds, so to speak. And um, and I'm not going to classify him as a diva, although I think many people have. I think that to kind of segue into the guru situation, we forget that the people who we learn from are human beings and we mm. put them up on this untouchable pedestal, which makes the times when they're experiencing human emotions, human feelings, and human conditions all the more hard. And I think mm. we've done that to a fault in yoga. I think we've done it to a fault in Pilates. I think in movement in general, it's certainly in politics and all of the leadership, but I, I, as for as much as it's pained me to watch the, the biographies and the documentaries talking about the really, um, really toxic ways that leaders in these industries have taken advantage mm -hmm. of their position. And Ron did not, um, to my knowledge, never, never felt that there was a toxicity there, but mm. I, you know, I'm thinking of Bikram and all of the, mm -hmm. all of the horrible documentaries that we've seen come out. I think that, um, if there's ever a time where we listen to the words of Maya Angelou, when you know better, you do better. Mm -hmm. It's right now, because I think that Right now is the time where we empower our students to have a thought process and values and discernment and understand that the information being passed down from one person to another is that, and it can be wrapped in a very special energy, but that does not make one person more impactful or have more power over another 
based on knowledge. In fact, I think that what we are doing when we when we become part of that paradigm or when we support that paradigm is we're instilling a sense of learned fear. And it's it that fear translates to our teaching. Mm. It doesn't make sense to have somebody at the top of the pile who knows everything, holding their knowledge close to their chest, wanting to create a legacy or, or drawing people into part of that legacy, and then having them be afraid that they're doing it wrong at the bottom. Mm. You know, but all but that does, I think. Together. Yeah. Like, no, you can't have one. They're oh, two they certainly sides do. of the opposite of the same coin. Yeah, well, it and it's what is it? It serves the power pa- paradigm, which has mm. been so familiar. Which is, I have the secrets, you don't. Yeah. The gateway to the secrets is money, or time, or adoration, or mm. if we're talking about other things that have happened, Bikram or sex, right? Mm. It's oh, there's a gateway to get through. <sighs> I mean, a, it's I'm creep. still shook by it. Mm, same, but in any case, it's like. When there's a gateway to information that doesn't, where the next step doesn't involve empowering, encouraging, Mm. and supporting somebody to use it in the best way they know possible, when it, when the end result is to support the upper paradigm, we have a problem. And this is my work with coaching teachers. It, it, it amazes me the amount of teachers that I work with who are really healing trauma from their experiences and also they are in a space where they they've been teaching for 25 years and they still don't think they're good enough and i don't know that their pilates experience made them feel that way uh you know exclusively but i do think it didn't help well i think it's probably um there's probably selection bias there in that you know if you have that guru and acolyte model where you know, the, the one person at the top of the pile, you know, knows the all truth with a capital T, then the sorts of people who are attracted to that are the sorts of people who, you know, are comfortable in the role of follower and acolyte, you know. Yeah. Um, and yeah. then the system reinforces that. Right. And then we get the forums, which I am not on <laughs> anymore, um, <laughs> but we get the forums where, you know, somebody's exacerbated because – exasperated exasperated because they've they've come into contact with a client who after all of the things have been said and done and given still doesn't get it and mm. the the blame or the focus is put on the client yeah that's that was, that that was when i left the forums i couldn't cope yeah. with that anymore i was just like no this is you, you you're missing the point completely because it's not about you doing it for it's the client. Got it's not about to you do with being. Exa- yeah. Exactly. The work is it, not about you. It's mm. a, it's a microcosm or it's the same it's the same scenario like so where you know whoever it is Ron Fletcher or you know Ray Aliskowitz or whoever is is the guru and then you're the you're the humble pilates instructor who's you know working hard to try and reproduce exactly what the guru has has you know, handed down from on high, and then you hand that down to the client, and the client's job is to work hard to reproduce what you've handed down from on high. You know, and if the client doesn't do it properly, well, that's their bad, obviously. You know, because there's nothing wrong with the work. You know, mm-hmm. like you're giving mm-hmm. it to them as written. Trust so, the work. Yeah. Trust the method. Right. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I. I mean, I think that the vein that you've tapped into, breathe, and just like the conversations surrounding pain science, et cetera, that's been so um, interesting is that level of critical thinking mm. and, um, and, and being willing to get it wrong, you know, in front of the client. I think there's not, there's, no, nothing more powerful than a teacher who can look at the room and go, this isn't working, is it? Let's move on. You know, because it shows that when something's not working, you move on. Yeah. <laughs> you recognize it as not a positive or, or something that needs more information, more support, more reference points. You don't hammer it home until it looks like you isn't, think it should. You let it, it go. Funny like that. Like you say that, that is that 
you know, totally resonates for me that, but that that's kind of the antithesis of the guru model really, because the guru model says, well, if we're handing down this, you know, this, this truth, capital T from on high on the stone mm-hmm. tablets, mm-hmm. well, like by definition, that's true, right? So we, we can't like years later go, actually, no, we got that bit wrong, you know, <laughs> let's mm-hmm. update that, mm-hmm. you know, because that, that is kind of antithetical to the whole model. It's like, it's, mm. you have, you're stuck in it. Jenna, yeah, last, uh, last night um, I was teaching uh, the final tutorial for our uh, incredible, uh, they're all incredible, uh, it's the February crew now who are, who are going through their week 20 and um, for those that don't know, there's a, a, Jenna actually holds a very special place in the final, the final lecture where she uh, has recorded a, a beautiful send off message for our students and I Jenna, I don't know how many. And, and sorry, I, I've watched that so many times when I give that final lecture. And when I walked in here today to record this podcast, because Chloe and I are physically in the room together and Jenna's uh, here on a big screen, I'm like, oh, it's the Jenna video come to life. <laughs> <laughs> it is the Jenna video come to life. Um, and I, the thing is I have now watched that video so many times and I freaking get teary every single time Jenna yeah. and the the last time I played it uh the last lecture I played it I was sat here and you were at, you know I sent you a photo of it you were up on this massive big screen and it was just it was so powerful mm. but segueing to last night uh it was the tutorial so that's where uh it's time for the students to digest you know what they what they took away from the lecture and talk about where they're going, et cetera. And uh, one of the students, their key takeaway from that entire lecture, of which you are a part, you are you, you, you come in at the end with your, your, your beautiful send off, their key takeaway from that, from that whole experience was what you said, which was, and, and she was, this was Steph, Steph's awesome. And Steph was like, look, I was, I was a bit over, you know, there were so many emotions going on in that, that final lecture. It was hard for me to know what to focus in on. And she said that the, the takeaway for me of that entire experience was Jenna saying, you don't need to know all the things. You don't have to have the factoids. Like, and, and, and she said that was just so liberating and so empowering and precisely what she needed to to hear and I and I hope that we set our students up with that throughout the course but it just really you really brought it home for her Jenna that and and she felt ready then to be able to go out there and 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 do it in the real world and in front of paying clients and know that mm-hmm. it's okay to say hey I don't know or I'm not sure or I can see if I can find out for you or I know who can find that out for you or well, why don't we explore this yeah. together right yeah. 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 So, um, thank you, Jenna. Thank you. <laughs> you're you're thank making you for sharing a that. Con- continual impact uh, mm. on on our students. Like you feel like I feel like Jenna Zafino is part of the Breathe Edu family. You're just totally. You're so yeah. Hey, um, I love it. I uh, love it. every time you tell you send me those messages. It just it warms my heart because I, I continually think. I I had a unique opportunity. My first training was a full apprenticeship, one-to-one. And so there were lessons that made it into the comprehensive study that wouldn't have maybe in a group forum. And that that training, I remember saying to my teacher, um, when do I get to teach your work? Because... um, that was the model, right? You go to the training and then you become a teacher trainer and then you open the studio or right. maybe not in that yeah. order. But um, she said, you're going to do your own work. And I said, but what if I just want to share this? And she's like, you will do your own work. Now, you know, it took me a number of years to get to that point, she but that's right. my work. Yeah, That's yeah. my work. I want to open the space for somebody who's uncertain, who has just as much right to teach another human in front of them and maybe even more effective than anybody with the master teacher title out there. I want them to feel empowered to do their work because I know Mm -hmm. those moments that we experience, and I, you know, I refer to them as the ahas, right? As we all do. Thank you, Oprah. Um, (laughs) But those moments we experience where they get it, it clicks something we said makes a change. Mm. I think that's, we're all teaching for those. And yeah. what what's so interesting to me is that master teachers don't have the monopoly on them. And often newer teachers are so scrappy 
and willing to go wherever they need to go for the client, that they can access aha moments more readily than somebody who's been teaching the same thing for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And so I want to empower those new voices to get out there, to be scrappy, to be in the room and not worry about what they don't know. They're not yeah. trying. You can't teach what you don't know. It's funny that you say that because one of the thing, one of the lectures that uh, we teach in our diploma of clinical Pilates is about um, the uh, we talk or in one of the lectures we talk about the relative effectiveness of healthcare practitioners as it relates to years of experience and there's actually quite a bit of literature on this where they basically uh, the researchers go through hospital records and they look at patients um, you know admitted you know for particular conditions or whatever and they look at you know basically how many of them die. Um, and then they mm. look at the treating uh, you know, doctor and uh, one of the things they looked at in this study was like how many years since that person completed medical school. And what they found was there was a positive correlation between the number of years since the doctor completed medical school and the chance of the patient dying. So basically the longer mm. you had been in practice, the more experienced you were, the more chance the patient died. And um, what when they sort of double clicked on that, what they find is that at more experienced practitioners – trust their own judgment more and contravene guidelines. So they're like, oh, I know the guideline says to do this, but, you know, I've done this a million times and I'm – In my I'm, experience. In my experience, I'm going to do yeah. it this way. Whereas the younger practitioners are more like, oh, well, the current guidelines say this, so I'm going to follow follow that. So their patients mm -hmm. die less often. So, you know, if, if I'm – as I'm being wheeled yeah. in a, to emergency room on the gurney, you know, I'm asking like you – know, <laughs> Give me the intern. Give me, yeah, yeah, give me <laughs> Where's the intern, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I have to tell you, uh, to that end, um, so, you know, the story of my pandemic experience was just in February, I had made a decision working with a business coach that I was going to let a lot of my in-person clients go, um, mainly to focus on this crux of the work that I wanted to create. And we, we had discussed that those people, however much I loved them, they were standing in front of the next stage. Um, and, and it was heartbreaking for me to do it. And especially when COVID hit, because I didn't have the online clients because everybody was still a little bit irritated that I had let them go. So yeah. in any case, um, it's been the majority as for all of us of teaching has been online. I was doing a lot of those sessions prior to 2020. So I had that engagement. I was able to develop some programs and, and things like that and, um, and really hone in my online teaching. But I realized that I was getting a little stagnant in a few areas. And so I started applying for entry-level Pilates positions for that, um, for remote, remote teaching positions. And, um, you know, there are some people who are like, no, we saw your resume. We just don't, we don't, we can't, we don't know why you're here. You've got to be here to steal the clients <laughs> and steal the teachers, you know, and all the things. But there have been a couple who have been like, we'd love to have you. And you know, what's so cool about it. I get to do like one of the things I'm working with is, and I'll share more about it because everybody's going to be like, I want to be a part of it. It's in beta mode. So I'm not going to promote it as of yet, but it's basically like an Uber for Pilates where people log on, they book a session unseen, they click up, they're on the screen. You've never seen them before. You get their, you know, their, um, your, they call it physical, physical activity readiness questionnaire. Um, you, you get some, you know, you have five minutes to kind of make it happen and then you move them on oh, screen. Oh, wow. I just love this. Beginner's mind is a invaluable, priceless resource. And when we get complacent, I think sometimes what happens is we start to maybe phone it in, in the comfortable ways. And then we try to stimulate ourselves out in the world. Like, oh, I guess I'll go learn golf or table tennis, or I'll take up macrame or buy a lot of plants or whatever it is. <laughs> and, um, but it's the teaching, it's the beginner's mindset and teaching. And so not a, like, I can't teach from a teacher trainer level for a 45 minute mat session. I know why those people are there and I've got to figure out in real time how to take the breadth and depth of knowledge I have, condense it through a filter so it's easy to understand, effective, pleasurable, and it's really personalized. It's the best boot camp I've ever had for my teaching in my life. It's fantastic. Sign me up. Yeah. That sounds it so doesn't pay well. 
that to her. Oh, <laughs> damn it. Well. I was going to say, that sounds so stimulating to me. Yeah, like, that sounds so stimulating to me. What a, well, what, it's part of that. What like, a great I way think, just to give you a bit of a fresh, you know, yeah. oomph as a, as a teacher. It's completely. We need, yeah. we need to be able to do that. I mean, I think the reason why this works, honestly, is because it is, um, it's not a long-term commitment. So, you know, I could have maybe satisfied the same thing by opening up my schedule and taking a bunch of new people, but then I would be in that same cycle again of having mm-hmm. the majority of my time taken up with private sessions. But with mm-hmm. this, I can do two or three per week. I just drop in, do the thing. Ideas are going. I see a new body from a new place doing new things with old stuff that I've taught for decades. And it's like, okay, I've got something here. Mm. It's, is, it's really good. Is there something yeah. there about, like, if you were to take your own clients, you know, there, there's already this relationship. They know who you are. They respect you, they, you know, they, et cetera. Whereas if you're kind of a faceless work experience kid at this studio where you're teaching, there's like, oh, there's this new instructor called Jenna, you know, don't know anything about her. Mm-hmm. Um, there, it's more, is it somehow more sort of fresh or you know, fewer expectations or something like that? I think so. I think, um, I think, you know, they're on this particular system, they're booking the product and not mm. the teacher. Mm-hmm. Mm. So I'd like to think that I get to be a pleasant surprise. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh my you gosh, know? could you imagine um, if you just got potluck, oh, I got Jenna Safino as my teacher. Well, they don't, they don't know, you know, the they, don't, don't know. They, don't they don't know. know. Sometimes <laughs> they'll look at my Instagram and they'll be like, wow, you, and I'm like, yeah, it's fine. I'm still a teacher, you know, um, <laughs> but awesome. the other part of it is like, I think we, we like this idea of new and shiny because it's exciting. So in my studio, you know, to get the new crop of teachers out in, in there to new cl- to clients was like, yes, new energy. But the newness has a reference point to um, sometimes inadequacy or lack of skills or what mm. have you. And I always encouraged the verbiage, especially for my front desk staff to say, you know, this is Jane. She loves working with women who are X, Y, Z or what have you. And she's really good at physical, um, athletic conditioning or something of that. Like, let's figure out who you want to work with. Like Mm -hmm. we would interview our, our new teachers as they graduated. And I would say, okay, who's your gem and who is not? And, you know, a lot of the teachers would be like, don't give me injuries. Don't give me pregnancy. Don't give me anything that I can mess up. And I'm like, okay, so you know what happens then they get the, the generally healthy clients. And then in three months they're injured, pregnant, or you know, <laughs> something happens and they have to see it Hashtag anyway. human being. But, <laughs> right. Right. And, um, I think that, I think it is part of the, the respectful ecosystem of a studio to really understand that there's a way to help someone infuse into the space as a new voice and a new, um, a new energy. And part of that is the responsibility for the teacher to figure out, you know, even in the most basic form, who am I and why am I here? Mm -hmm. You know, because I might be, I'm Jenna and I like to have fun while I'm moving. I'm Jenna and I, I basically, my teacher, my teaching is a stand up comedy routine. You just happen to be moving throughout it. <laughs> Whatever it is, you know. Your classes so are funny. I try. When you, when you teach to a room of pretend people and your dog stays asleep the entire time, even when you're bouncing on a trampoline, you have to pull the humor out from somewhere. Otherwise, it's like a really sad situation. <laughs> is it funny? And I, I mean, I don't. Uh, you know, last time I was teaching Pilates was a while ago, but I remember you when know, I when I owned a studio, we used to, with all the, the the instructors' bios on the on the website, for example, and the way that we ex- explained that, we're, like we used to lead with qualifications, like you know, so and so is qualified yeah. with A, B, and C, yeah. and they've done this and that certification. Um, and we're, isn't it funny that like in in most realms of life, I, I'm thinking of like if I go to a dentist, I never ask to see their degree, you know. Yeah. Um, or if I'm going uh, flying on an airplane, I never, you know, go. Where was the pilot trying? Yeah, like, it's, oh my gosh, it's so true. <laughs> no, you, you know, when they do the opening, did he do shift, the weekend like, course or I did I he trust? do the eighteen months? <laughs> yeah, right. Oh my gosh, seriously, seriously. 
<laughs> yeah. And uh, to that point, I know that there is another instructor on this platform and it's, you know, it leads with classical Pilates and it goes into every continuing education certification. It goes down the line. And my bio is I'm Jenna. I'm here to give you a really energized session that meets your personalized needs and give you something that you can take away with and enhance your life through. <laughs> and it's like, that's, you know, th that there, if you really want to know, I will dust off that certificate, but I'm, I'm willing to bet that the clients who see themselves in the bio are going to be more inclined to work with somebody because everybody, the human condition is we just want to be seen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Social media has really, really given us a lot of evidence for this. You know, yeah. we just want to be seen and acknowledged. So if you can do that with your clients, I'm not saying it doesn't matter how much experience you have. There is proficiency with experience. There's a mm. thought process. There's fail safes to some degree. You know, you have your tried and true sequencing. You have your stick. You have your your um, Diane Severino calls it your patter. You know, you're you come in with a with a grounded sense of confidence that mm -hmm. is is fun for people. But that isn't resigned just to the amount of time that you've been teaching. New teachers can still step into that energy and they can still access that individual yeah. need element mm. and, and see the human in front of them and say, what, do, what would feel great to you today? If what you is could leave experiencing one thing, you know? I, yeah. I love that, Jenna. I think that what you've just said is could be extremely helpful uh, to our, a lot of our listeners, in particular those that are newer. So, what are your when you say um, a new teacher can still step into that energy? What are some tips you could give a new teacher to step into that energy? Well, I think that it is imperative that you have what I would refer to as a self attendance practice. So what you can't expect is to be running from studio to studio to place to place, not eating, never sitting down with yourself, um, not sleeping well, never moving your own body, not feeling dropped into your energy and expect for expect to walk into a room and be dropped in and, and, and tuned yeah. into the room. It, it just that is it's. I don't like saying self-care because self-care has been so packaged and mm. self-attendance is to me, it's recognizing what you need to access a flow state. Yeah. And that flow mm. state can be any level of anything in the world. Self-attendance is not relegated to the Pilates profession, mm. but when I'm teaching and it flows, I know that I have moved myself, fed myself, rested myself, inspired myself with music, books, or a good conversation. And I have not been engaging into junk media, social media, news cycles that are looking for clicks or gossip. And that is important because I said this on the podcast and it's worth repeating again. No one finishes a gossip session about another teacher or a student or another way of teaching Pilates and immediately goes to do their best work. It doesn't happen. You can't carry that energy of jealousy and the rest of it into a session that serves another mm. human being. Mm. Jealousy does not equal service. Mm. And if you think it does, you're lying to yourself. So you've got to recognize if I do all these things, if I sleep and eat and move and connect, then what's the thing that's going to set me off and how am I attending mm. to that too? So recently I took away all of the metrics on Instagram. I don't know how many likes you have. I don't know how many likes I have. I'm posting what I feel like posting, what I feel represents my work and what's needed in, in my community. I don't know. I, I'm not in the competition. Mm -hmm. I'm currently a spectator who has really good signs. And that's it. You know that and Australia did that. So, uh, so the whole yeah. of it's only just recently come back on that that we can choose uh, mm -hmm. in in Australia in our Instagram if we want to see likes. But it was actually yeah. that was actually just blanket taken off us. They decided from a it, my understanding was it had to do with a mental health uh, decision, and uh, they just wiped it off. So for I, I gosh, it was a long time. I'm thinking it was over a year. I could be 
wrong. I'm sure someone oh, knows the metrics. I hope yeah, they don't that, bring it back. That we weren't, that well, they have now brought it back just recently. Okay. And, and you had the decision. It said, would you like to yeah. click on this to be able to see li- uh, yeah. likes or would you like to keep it blanketed? But it was actually taken away. So we had no idea. We, as in yeah. Australia, yeah, which yeah. is really interesting. Yeah. So that's um, a really powerful decision to to make, yeah. I think the other yeah, thing I think you, it is. you said there, Jenna, is um, that struck me is, uh, you know, basically, you know, you're talking about self-attendance and in my mind that translates into basically, you know, creating the conditions where a peak state is you know, more likely, you know. Um, mm-hmm. And I think, you know, I remember from my own experience when I was relatively new instructor, and I, I imagine this is what a lot of relatively new instructors do, is try and remember all the things. It's like, oh, mm-hmm. what are the things I've got to say and the exercises I've mm-hmm. got to teach and the how many springs and the blah, 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 foot bar settings, whatever mm-hmm. it is that they've got to remember the things. Actually, mm-hmm. the things are the least important, focusing on the state and 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 being present for the client, mm-hmm. uh, you know, yeah. is what's going to create that optimal yeah. experience. And I think, be, again, being transparent. So at Momentum Fest, who knows how many years ago? I don't know. We don't know time anymore, right? Mm-hmm. Everything, it, was either, it was either 2019 or it was 2021. Um, but in any case, one of the classes that I took or that I taught was um, I decided to teach the mat work in reverse order, the full advanced mat work in reverse order. That's so, so cool. Let's just think about it's like it. It's saying was very the alphabet fun. backwards. Wow. So you started with the push exactly. up. Exactly. And- <laughs> mm-hmm. And I was pumped for that class. And then they put me on the schedule at 7 a.m. I don't do well at 7 a.m. I don't, I, 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 I have a child who pretty much has never slept since he was born. And so <laughs> the first thing in the morning time zone for me is just not a good thing. So what did I do? I took that suckered order and I put it as part of my tattoo <laughs> and it was backwards, you know, top to bottom. So in the event that I forgot, I would know it was there. And then what else did I do? I stood up at the front of the room and I said, I want you all to know that I have the order written on my forearm as part of my tattoo in the event that I forget a movement. So we're all going to be in this together. I'll be directing, but this this. is my experience and yours, and we're going to work with it, and we're going to be transparent about what needs to happen at 7 in the morning. And they laughed, and we we all had that level playing field. So if you're a new teacher and you say, hey, I'd love to try this piece that I've only taught a few times, and if you're willing, I'd love to bring it into class today. I'm going to progress you to the point where we can be prepared for it with all of the things and the strategies, and then we'll have a nice, you know, exit from that piece. I will be having uh, using my notes. I will have my notes nearby. I probably won't use them. They'll be nearby just for a little bit of uh, of comfort. Are we all okay with this? Wow. Why not? Just be overt. Mm. I just love that. Mm. Why yeah. not? Be tra- you yeah. know? Mm. We're talking, we talk so much about our authentic selves and our authentic voices. And we walk in the studio, we're like, I'm perfect. I know everything. I know all the fascia. I know all the nerve endings. And I know everything you need to do for scoliosis, spondylolithesis, sciatica, you name it. I know it all. And then meanwhile, they're shitting themselves in the bathroom because they, they don't know it all. Yep. And nobody expects them yep. to. You know, and, it's and like. Here's the thing no yeah. one knows it all. No one knows nobody it all. Nobody does. No, nobody does. Even nobody does. Dare I say it? Joseph Pilates didn't know it all. Like no one what knows it all. I, can, I felt some energy coming down from the heavens when you just said that. <laughs> well, I mean, listen. Joseph Pilates didn't have an iPhone. That's the only element we need to like focus on to like bring <laughs> us back into the reality of this. The resources, the tools, the network. And the research that was available during his lifetime is not the same as what's available during our lifetime. And therefore, he didn't know it all. He was not Jesus. He was not God. He was a man with a brain that knew how to put pieces and parts together 
force bodies in many cases into shapes <laughs> to get them into, uh, you know, to, to comply into a method. He did wonderful things. But, you know, one of the things Ron would always say, say is that Joe was the genius and Clara was the true teacher. So when he would get frustrated with you and throw his hands up in the air because he knew it, he knew what he wanted and it wasn't happening, she would be the one to swoop in and say, here, I show you. Right. And that's how things would be done. And, you know, I think that, um, I think that we do our entire method a service when we say Joseph Pilates knew this and we can learn from this, but he didn't know it all. And there's a lot we can learn. I, um, I was just having a little giggle to myself before with the thought of actually Joseph Pilates being in the era of iPhones and my brain, no, yeah. well, my, bra I, my brain directly went to some very angry tweets. I feel <laughs> like he would be, he would be in on twi wrong. Twitter, Twitter is where he would be. The whole world I mean, would have be you a better place the if they're doing my <laughs> Have you read the JFK letter from Joseph Pilates? No. Tell I've been You've told. got to find the JFK okay. letter. He wrote and he said, basically, you need to do my method to end the war. I mean, he was unabashed. We will post he that in the show notes. He was bold yeah. AF. I mean, he, you know, there was, it's, it's, it's entertaining. I think it might be on um, Pilates.com on Balanced Body, but yeah. it's fascinating because you have, if we pretend like this man didn't have an ego, we're lying. Oh, I think he had a I I think he had a huge ego. Mm. I mean, I yeah. feel like you see that in uh Cage Lion. <laughs> <laughs> I was always, I I was gonna have to say it. I was always gonna have we know I love this book. Mm. But I yeah, I can't it, I mean and 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 he was so uh you know, when we're talking about guruism and we're talking about this sense that things have to be done in a certain way and perfectly or don't do them, I kind of get that vibe from Joseph as in like he was the cage line. I mean, he he was very restrictive with who could teach his method, uh, how the method was taught, you know, very particular about keeping things to the order and the specifics of that. And then he was constantly frustrated that the rest of the world, you know, the whole world mm. wasn't doing his exercises. Well, he wasn't enabling the whole world to do his exercises, right? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. A very specific execution. Mm. Yeah. And he seemed to have a lot of anger around it. I mean, if you read your health, I mean, I love reading your health for the giggles um, yeah. because there's so many, like that fantastic line when it, where he's like, think about it, you saps. You saps, yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> how much of a big swig of his whiskey did he have before he wrote that line? And that's where I'm getting, yeah. you know, that would definitely be one of his tweets. He'd be calling yeah. us all saps. I think like- A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I don't think he would embrace the world. You know, and no. what's interesting about that is like, let's, let's think about, so you have that sentiment in print, you saps, right? Where it's, it's like not his words, but if it's not my method, it's crap is kind of, you know, the overall yeah. sentiment to a lot of, a lot of the writings and some of the stories, right? Mm. So what is it that some of the most toxic people in the Pilates industry online sound like? Mm. Uh-huh. It's call it uh you know call it that uh evolutionary biology you didn't have to be of the same DNA to pick that up. The apple doesn't and fall hold far on from the to tree. that sentiment. Yeah. It was passed down, yeah. you know. Mm. So hey um mm. you know I've got to wrap up shortly cuz I've actually got to give a uh Q and A in a sec but um but you I, don't want to. I don't want to. <laughs> I, well, gosh, I want to I do the Q and A, but I, I want to just chat for talking. another hour. <laughs> um, but I do want to say, like, I've been thinking as you as you both were were talking there, and I think, like, well, I want I want to inject some nuance into this conversation um, about, like, okay, so there's a guru model at one end where the you know the the guru you know sits on high and pronounces truth with a capital T, and we must you know take it as written and literally so. Uh, and then pass it on verbatim to the next generation or to the client or whatever, and all right, and so I think we're all in agreement that that's there's some problems with that, mm. some serious flaws with that model. Um, 
And at the other end, this this kind of nihilistic, like, well, no one knows nothing and there are no rules and you can do whatever you want. And, and therefore it's not Pilates. Yeah. yeah. So, And, and yeah. I think we probably all agree that that's not the optimal situation either and that there's some right. kind of midpoint where, like, I mean, I have people in, in my life that are, uh, are that I trust, right, as sources of information. Mm-hmm. And if so-and-so said something, I would, by default, I would believe it, mm-hmm. right? Because, I, you know, in the past, my experience has been that this person produces reliable information on this topic. And I'm sure that we all have those people that we, you know, that we trust uh, on you, certain topics. Jenna. Right? <laughs> but I think that for me, the the line is, you know, between between having someone be like a trusted authority on a topic, for example, so I've got people that I trust about business or science or, you know, biomechanics or whatever, you know, I trust them on that topic. Um you know, so the difference in my mind between someone who's a trusted authority and someone then crossing over into being a guru is like with a guru, there's some kind of element of sanctity. You know, that it's it's almost it's almost like taboo to to question the you know the wisdom with a capital W of the guru. Whereas, yeah. you know, my yeah. biomechanics lecturer, who I respect greatly, if I said, Well, hold on, what you said there just doesn't make sense to me, that would be totally fine. Mm. You know, that's it. Totally fine. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree completely. And I was thinking, I thought you were going to go a different direction with that comment, but I, I think that what we're talking about ultimately is responsibility. So the guru model puts the responsibility um, or the focus on maintaining the hierarchy mm. within the organization um, for, you know, any number of purposes, right? But the education model puts the focus on the ability to have an open forum and to ask and answer questions, mm. Mm. no matter what the experience level is. We're both so when a teacher for truth is together. empowering, yeah, when the teacher is empowering their student to ask them something and also can stand in a space and and be responsible for what they don't know as well to say, I don't know that and open that as a channel, because we, if we're moving anywhere with this work, it's gotta be in the vein of curiosity and exploration. And that doesn't, I'm not even talking about changing choreography. I could care less about that conversation. And I change a lot. I choreograph a lot, but it's a matter of really understanding that when we ask questions, we gain insight, we broaden perspective, and that perspective often creates space for others to come into the mix and have an experience with us or for themselves. And when we don't allow questions or we create uh, an ecosystem, an environment that shuns or shames questions, it's that um, at most of what we've been talking about, I hear Brene Brown's voice in the back of my head, but it's that daring leadership versus armored leadership. The armored leadership says, nope, don't, don't rock the boat. This is how we do it here. We don't have room for that. We don't know how to handle that. It's different. And we've always done it this way. Mm. And the daring leadership says, let's explore it. Let's have a dialogue. Let's put it on the table and look at it from a lot of different angles so we can see if it fits in with the ecosystem of what we're trying to create here. And so I don't, I don't come from a place where we're going to have businesses built on Kumbaya, everybody's welcome. And, you know, like, let's just have a utopian society. I, there's way too much humanity and human feelings and experiences to to like suggest that that could be a, that could happen but where i think we fall short in our arena of pilates is having open dialogues with many voices we like to pick out a few i've certainly been one of them um and listen to those people and let them be the authority part of that i think is because people like to just sit back and listen and they don't necessarily are, they're not always up for the challenge of figuring out what they have to say and that's that's a natural occurring situation but part of it is because we are used to seeing a panel of superstars and i think that we really rob ourselves the ability to broaden 
the conversation of where this work can go and who it can help when we only recognize a few people as having the right to speak. Mm. And I, even in the major steps that have happened in the Pilates industry, especially in the U.S. over the year, what I see is a lot of that same conversation where, you know, we are now in love with a whole new panel of people who are wonderful people. But we're doing the same thing where we create stardom and fame, and we do it because it feels good and comforting to have someone we turn to that has answers. But if, if that person doesn't also challenge us to ask questions and isn't asking the questions of themselves, then we're just recycling the old pattern with new yeah. faces on the panel. And so that's why I've kind of taken a big step back from away from a lot of it. Um, I don't want to talk about Pilates particularly anymore, unless it's in the vein of let's, let's take it apart and see where it's going and see, see what we think about it. What's really underneath the cliches and the, the quotes, what is, what is this thing and, and how are we to behave in it and interface with it in such a way where it can actually walk the talk that we we like to say about it. Like it's for everybody. That that remains to be true, I think, in many cases. Or it's, you know, trust the method. Sometimes Pilates hurts my body. Sometimes I can't do it because I know I'm going to be put out of whack. And it's okay to say that. Other times it's the most amazing miracle thing ever. But the ability to have an ongoing conversation and to pull in different voices, different points of reference, different life experiences, different times in our history. 2019 asked me how many people had Zoom accounts. I listened in March to Pilates Unfiltered and I, I did an episode and I said, hey, everyone. So, you know, I know a lot of people are coming in. I've talked to some people in Singapore. Um, it looks like there's going to be a lockdown there. I want to tell you about a service I've been using for a couple of years. It's called Zoom. Wow. Um, I know a lot of you are really worried about teaching online, but let me, let me tell you a little bit about the best benefits of doing it. And here's how I set up. <laughs> please tell me, please tell me at that, that moment too, you also went and bought some shares. <laughs> there was there was have. something that gave you this idiot. gut feeling to actually buy some shares in it. I mean, there are so many mistakes in 2020. That was definitely one of them. But I was just like, you know, because before that, everybody was like, no, online teaching is bad. Yeah. It will never happen yeah. unless it's on yeah. Pilates anytime, which was great. And, you know, but yeah. it's like, and now we're all there. Now yeah. we're all there. So yeah. like, and it's funny that it was okay on Pilates anytime, Isn't but it wasn't funny? okay. We, it's, it's like kind of good muscles, bad muscles. We have these like uh, un, yeah. un, unrecognized kind of paradoxical assumptions in so many different areas yeah. that, you know, something is great in one context, but the same thing in a very slightly different context. Cause, is, cause almost terrible. every teacher I ever knew subscribed to Pilates anytime yeah. and went there for to get the factoids, to get the, mm -hmm. you know, to learn. But all of a sudden it's like, you can't like, do Pilates oh, online. You can't do yeah. Pilates online. You can't yeah. teach Pilates online. But we've been learning from Pilates yeah. anytime for years. Yeah. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, it is interesting. And it all, it, it took, well, it took a couple things. It did take the shift of having yeah. one thing eliminated. Yeah the time and also the accessibility, because let me tell you, as somebody who's been running a media company for the past, since 2015, the, the things, my, my studio has become exponentially more functional in the past year mm. than it ever was before. And it's not just due to it being a couple of years after 2018. It's because every app and startup that was waiting to get going went and every like zoom was not that accessible yeah. to everybody yeah. it certainly wasn't you know doing its thing like all of the platforms upped their game yeah quickly. they did yeah. yeah and it made it it made it easy easier for people to do it um and there was a reason behind it you know yeah. so i just think the the point that i'm making with that is what makes us think that that situation of totally issuing teaching Pilates online one day and then bringing your entire studio online another day is any different than questioning the beliefs you've held about 
the method mm-hmm. your, itself or how you teach it or what have you. We can change. We're yeah. we're based in change. Yeah. And it's not change for the sake of change, but it's change for how we are doing what we've intended to do in the first place with this work, which is help people. Yeah. And so I think, yeah. There's, I think just, you know, I do have to finish up. So I want to round up on that because I think that is yeah. such a, such a powerful thought. And I just, you know, when you say that, I just think of in my own life, there have been, you know, several situations that I've let drag on for too long. Like when, you know, staying in a relationship that was, you know, should have ended years before or keeping an employee that should have been let go years before or maintaining a friendship or, you know, habits or whatever that I should have let go of. And I just couldn't mm-hmm. contemplate at the time. I just couldn't contemplate the possibility of letting go of those things. Yeah. But then one, you know, when something happened that kind of basically made it easier for me or made it more painful to not let go of it or whatever, and, and I finally did it, I was like, there's the sense of relief. And I'm sure we've all felt this of like, oh, that is so much better now. I wish I'd done that years ago. And But mm-hmm. for all of those years, I could never see it happening ever, ever, ever in a million years. But now when you let go of mm-hmm. it, all of a sudden it's like, oh. That was mm-hmm. so easy and it's so much better now. A hundred percent. I think that, um, I think there, it goes the opposite way too. There are a lot of people who are emerging from the lockdown and they're like, oh, thank God I don't have to go online anymore because mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> they never wanted as part of yeah. their, their paradigm, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it, there's a process that brings us into a thing. There's a process that brings us out of it. Yeah. It's not change for change's sake, but I think that when, when you flex the muscle of self-trust and you gain the experiences of letting things go, it does become easier over a period of time. And you, you remember that on the other side of letting go is extreme relief. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Jenna Zafino, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, thank Jenna. You. I love you so much. Can't, can't <laughs> wait till so the next much. time. I know. I know. This is the type of conversation that, you know, I live for. And again, I'm teaching to a lot of, in the most case, like in most cases, pretend people that I put in the room. They all love my classes. They do. But they do. <laughs> They're great. They gaga. They're like, yes, go girl. The plants are like, my yes. favorite but- clips, Jenna, are the clips you share where you are, you're teaching to, you know, your camera, the recording. You're so yeah. funny. Yeah. I like I'm there. I feel like I'm there in your class. It's, I mean, it, it's, I, I, I love what I'm doing right now. I've never been happier in teaching. And what's great about it is I'm pulling from past experiences. So it's yeah. not just contrived. I'm pulling from the best of my experience of the past 20 years and using that as the model. And if it's not working, like today it wasn't working. And I was like, I'm not going to, why am I forcing it? Exactly. Let it go. Let it go. Full relief. <laughs> <laughs> we could go into a frozen song here, but we won't. We have to cut it off. I just we want to could. keep talking. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you both. I appreciate being here. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.